like to welcome you here today, and uh, thanks for turning us on on Facebook. Uh, I'd like to welcome those who are out of state in West Virginia, in South Carolina, in North Carolina, in Mississippi, and in Texas. So uh, I'd like to welcome you here today, and of course, Ohio. Uh, show of hands who all did their lesson this week. If you're home and you did your lesson this week, I know you're saying, well, Frank, uh, you didn't tell me what the lesson was, and you are correct. Uh, we are in Romans chapter 8, I apologize. And just to get this out of the way, next week we'll be in Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 15. So you can write that down and uh, uh, write your questions down as you're studying your, your lesson this week. So anybody have any contacts this week? Anybody call anybody? Anybody holler over to their neighbor and say, hey, uh, you know, we got the church on on uh, Facebook. Uh, we need to uh, watch it. Will you watch it with me? So just remember that uh, there's all kind of good uh, preaching out on the Facebook and on the on the web. So you can go out and watch that uh, while you're confined to your to your home. Uh, we do take up an offering uh, in our Sunday school class, as I told you the last. A couple weeks it goes towards our military care packages, but uh, if you want to, if you're a regular member and you want to send in your tithe or your offering, or you're a friend of the church, want to do that, uh, the, you can send it in to PO Box 68, Sardis, Ohio 43946. We do take prayer requests, and we do uh, pray for those who uh, send us in a prayer request, and like to ask you to write those down on, on Facebook, and we will pray for those. And, and uh, I promise you that we'll, we'll pray for them. Let me just uh, say, if, if, if you have any praises during this most difficult time that we've been in the last month or so, why don't you write those down so we can see those also. And I, I'd like to share a praise with you this week. Uh, I was putting out my plants. I, I take them in and out every night because it's cold, you know. Well, this morning I saw that I had a uh, tomato blossom on a, on a plant, so uh, I was I was pretty happy about that. And, and uh, anyway, it's a little thing, you know. It, it doesn't take much to make me happy. But uh, another thing is, uh, I got to put in a uh, an ice maker in my in my uh, freezer. It broke, and I ordered one from Walmart.com, and got to put it in. And uh, just a little thing, you know. So you can write anything write any of the little praises you have, and uh, we'll be glad to praise the Lord with you for it. So our lesson title is called Secure, and our biblical truth for today is, all who accept the gospel have a sure hope for a future as children of God. And uh, our lesson comes out of Romans chapter 8, and we're going to cover uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 11. 12 through 25, but uh, we'll, we'll look at a few more in Romans also. But my resources, I've been trying to tell you what my resources are every week. And uh, of course my Bible, and of course my, my uh, Sunday school book is Explore the Bible. It's, my, it's a leader's guide for Romans. And I get on the web and I look at a site called blueletterbible.org. Uh, BibleStudyTools.com, uh, Christian-Quotes.com, uh, John MacArthur Sermon, a Strong's Concordance. I'm sure that you are all familiar with a Strong's Concordance. I use a Strong's Concordance, and I used uh, Thayer's Greek Lexicon also this week. So those are some of my resources. And some of those things you can get out on the web for free, like the, uh, the Strong's Concordance and Thayer's uh, Greek Lexicon, you can get that. You can get all that stuff for free uh, that I just mentioned. So anyways, let's go to our text. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a few verses out of uh, Romans chapter 8 and uh, get us started here. We're going to start with verse 12. So then, brothers, we are not obligated to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, obligated to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Verse 13, 
For if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Verse 14. All those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back in fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Have a Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are children, God's children. Verse 17. And if children, also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, seeing that we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. All right. We will go to our lesson now. And... We find ourselves back in Romans chapter 8 this week. Um, and I believe Romans chapter 8 is one of the great chapters in our Bible. Uh, it begins in verse 1 with a promise. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And ends, starting in, in verse 35, it ends with the promise that nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The uh, overarching theme of Romans chapter 8 could be called, now, now this is my, I came up with this, so don't, don't laugh, but it could be called the Holy Spirit makes living the Christian life possible in spite of our flesh. I'm going to say that again. The theme of it could be called, Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit makes living the Christian life possible in spite of our flesh. And if we look back at chapter 7, starting in verse 14 through 25, it describes the new man in relationship with the law. But in, in chapter 8, this describes the new man in relation to the Holy Spirit and the Spirit's work and through the new man or you and I who are in Christ. Now, here's a question. How many times do you think the Holy Spirit is mentioned in chapter 8? Now, just throw out, write it down, put it on Facebook, just real quick. All right, I, I gave you enough time. Interestingly, the Spirit is mentioned 19 times in chapter 8. Amen. Wow. Um, now, here's another question. How has living, or how has having the Holy Spirit living in you helped you since becoming a Christian? If you'd like to write down comments on Facebook, that's fine. But how has having the Holy Spirit in you and living in you helped you as a Christian? In Romans chapter 6, verse 14, it says, Sin will no longer rule over you because you are not under the law, but under grace. You see, sin no long, is no longer the believer's ruler. Sin no, is no longer your master. And you who are saved are a child of God. You know, this lesson could have went in a lot of directions. Uh, one being like last week, I said a little bit uh, about the mercy seat. The mercy seat of God. And uh, it was behind the veil. It was in the Holy of Holies. And, and only one day in a year, on the Day of Atonement, did the high priest go in there. And I talked a little bit about that, but what I wanted to say was the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross, the temple veil, the veil that covered the Holy of Holies, where no one saw that, only one person a year, was torn from top to bottom, exposing the mercy seat of God. Nothing is hidden from God now because of Christ. There's no more shedding of blood. It was all done for the last time on Calvary. Christ is our ultimate day of atonement. There's no more priest. 
Jesus is our high priest. He's the one we go to when we have sin in our lives. The Bible says if we do sin, that we have one sitting where? At the right hand of God, intercessing for us. So, the, you know, this lesson could have went a lot, a lot of different ways. And, and, and that first verse in, in Romans chapter 8, it, that's one to hold on to for the rest of your life. I mean, it's one of the, the memory verses of, of, of your heart. Therefore, no condemnation now exists for those in Christ Jesus. So, sin no longer ha is your master because now you're a child of God. And as every child picks up traits and tendencies of their earthly parent, we now have a heavenly parent, our heavenly father, that we should at least pick up on some of his traits. Paul said, imitate me, for I imitate Christ. So we should uh, have some of his characteristics, right? Now, you know, I can ask you a question, or, and it's be a rhetorical question, because we all know the answer. Is being a Christian easy? And we'd all say, no, no, not all the time. Uh, you know, I wish, I wish I could say, sure it is, but uh, it's not. And, and here's a quote from uh, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and I often quote him in, a, in my Sunday school class, and if you don't know anything about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know, take five minutes, look on the internet, uh, look him up, read his, his uh, story, and uh, you'll find out what Christian suffering is uh, and what he did uh, for Christians in Europe during World War II. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, it is only because he became like us that we can become like him. We, we become like him when the Holy Spirit enters our body. At least we should. And if, you, and if you're not acting more like Christ every day, then listen, Christian, there's something wrong. I, and, you know, I tell my Sunday school class this all the time. We need to fight the flesh. And, uh, and it's not easy. It's not easy. And Jesus warned us that it wouldn't be easy. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him do what? Let him deny himself and take up his cross and do what? Follow me. He didn't say go back to the world. He said follow me. Follow Christ. And in John chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. So we can see, if we take following Christ seriously, it's not easy all the time. Now the question is, how can we as Christians live out our lives in a way that is consistent with Christ's commands? Well, the short answer is found in verse 12 and 13. Let me read this to you. So then, brothers, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You're not obligated to live according to the flesh. Our obligation is to the Spirit of God that lives within us. In verse 13, Paul gives us these two if sentences. Number one, if you live by the flesh, you're going to what? You're going to die. Now this isn't the physical death, but it's the spiritual death that one will face at the great white throne judgment. And you can find that in uh, Revelation chapter 20. And that is, and the great white throne judgment is for the unsaved people, okay? The Christian is not going to face that, okay? The Strong's Concordance uh, 
describes the word flesh or uh, it's translated as the human nature with its frailties and its passions physically and morally and it describes it also as carnally minded the flesh is carnally minded you know I I haven't mentioned this yet on Facebook but I want to mention this uh, the greatest Sunday school teacher I ever had was Dave Van Keen. And, uh, and, uh, and I get teary-eyed whenever I uh, talk about Dave and what he's meant to me in my life. But uh, he asked a question one time, is there such a thing as a carnally-minded Christian? And, uh, and there was much discussion about that. But the answer has to be no. We can't be carnally-minded. Because that's the flesh coming out. That's the flesh coming out in us. And Thayer's Greek lexicon describes the flesh as the sensuous nature of man, the animal nature with cravings which incite to sin. You know, this is all opposed to one who has been born again. One who has been born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. And number two, that was number one. If you live by the flesh, you're going to die. And here's his other if uh, sentence. But if by the Spirit you put to death the what? The deeds of the body. You have to fight the flesh. You have to fight it. You will live. And where will you live? You'll live eternally. James chapter 2, verse 26 says, For as the body without the Spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Now, if you look at that, the first part of that verse says, without the spirit is dead. There are people without Christ walking around that are spiritually dead. And, and that's the job of the church. That's the job of each Christian is trying to get people who aren't saved, saved. So they become spiritually alive and live for Christ. Their life will be changed. And the only way to do that is through Christ. It's through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to call a person. Martin Luther says, The Spirit who lives in a born-again Christian is the highest, noblest part of a man. The Spirit who lives in a born-again Christian is the highest, noblest part of man. Then he goes on to say, the man with the Spirit qualifies him to lay hold of incomprehensible, invisible, ex eternal things. My question is, what invisible things might he be talking about? Well, let me, let me say, here's an invisible thing. The forgiveness of your sins. What a wonderful, wonderful gift that you don't even see, hmm. that you've been forgiven. Amen. What about uh, this invisible place that we know is there, heaven? We know heaven is there. How about the invisible thing of understanding? You know, when I was a kid and I didn't know Christ, or a young man didn't know Christ, I heard somebody read the Bible. I had no idea what they were, they were saying. It was like they were talking Chinese to me or Russian to me. I had, I had zero clue. But when the Holy Spirit came in and, and saved me through the blood of Christ, the, my eyes were open just like Paul and the scales fell off my eyes and I had understanding of, of the Scripture. And I had peace that I'd never had before. It's that invisible or invisible eternal things that uh, Martin Luther says we can lay hold of. We can grab a hold of those things. And you know what What the world uh, thinks is, is marvelous and, and wonderful, Christians they think it's rubbish. And what we hold on to is, is irreplaceable or, or uh, eternal. The world thinks that's rubbish. We're at odds with each other. The flesh is fighting the spiritual side of man all the time. So what does living by the Spirit look like? 
Well, one aspect of living by the Spirit would certainly be a life of obedience to the Lord, wouldn't it? Jesus said in, in John chapter 15, or 14, verse 15, If you love me, you will do what? You will obey my commandments. That's right. You know, I just mentioned that, be, uh, that being a Christian was not always easy. In fact, it can be quite difficult at times because there are times you you don't want to fight the flesh. Now, I'm not, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. There's times you don't want to obey the Holy Spirit who convicts you of the things you're wanting to do or maybe the things that you've already done. See, there's times in your life, just like Paul said, that that I do things that I shouldn't do, and I don't do things that I should do. We fight that. We fight that all the time. And two things I want to say about that. Number one, if you're fighting that, you're not alone. You're not alone. Because this Sunday school teacher fights that, and I know you fight it. Because if I fight it, you fight it. And, uh, and talking about fighting it, I believe that you're going to fight that until the day you die. Until the very day you die, I think that you're going to fight your flesh. And number two is, praise God. Praise God that the Holy Spirit convicts you, or convicts us, when we do wrong. And after we've done wrong. You know, when I first became a Christian, I, and I've always told my Sunday school class this, well, I was, I was telling the preacher, I, I just felt like I was in a can the last couple weeks up here, and I feel like I'm out of a can. I, I even wore my, my uh, uh, old crop shoes today, <laughs> so I feel better. But uh, anyways, uh, when I first became a Christian, I wanted everything in my life. I mean, and I, I tell my Sunday school class, you have to... Uh, you have to uh, study other things other than just coming to church once a week, hearing one sermon. You have to read read sermons. I'm kind of a sermon hound. I like to I like to listen to sermons. I like to read sermons. I like to watch sermons. Uh, but also, I like to read quotes. I like to read uh, Spurgeon sermons, particularly. But uh, when I became a Christian. I, I used to listen to Jimmy Swagger all the time. And I know you guys are scratching your heads for oil. That guy was a nut, you know. But listen, hey, he had a lot of good singing on there. He had a lot of good preaching on there, too. And one thing he's, that, that stuck with me, with Jimmy Swagger, he, he said this. And this I remember this from 34 years ago. He said, you better hope that the convicting power of the Holy Spirit never leaves you. And I believe that to be true. The Holy Spirit, if the convicting power of the Holy Spirit ever leaves you, you're in trouble. And uh, we thank God uh, for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit because this is how we know God's still working in your life. If you are convicted by sin in your life, praise the Lord. Good. Hopefully you do something about it. And Paul tells us in Galatians uh, chapter 5, verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You see, Jesus, when he died on the cross, he died that, that sin might not have dominion over your life anymore. Remember we talked about the stages of man and, and the themes of, of Romans. First it was the sinfulness of man or the, the sinful man, and then we talked about how to get justified, or the justified man, and now we're talking about the sanctified man, or the sanctification of man, the holiness that a Christian's supposed to have, so that our lives might reflect, and might magnify the Spirit at work in us. And what are those things in the Spirit? With love, with joy, with peace, with patience, with kindness, with goodness, 
with faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. See, if we walk in those things, we're not going to gratify the desires of the flesh. Okay? And Galatians chapter 5, verse 18 tells us, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now I'm going to go back and read uh, chapter 8, verse 8 through 11. And I'm going to be so happy whenever I get back to my regular Sunday school class because I'm going to have Sonia read for me and I'm going to have Jerry and Tammy read for me and, uh, you know, Dave Main. There's just so many people that I could have reading for me. My pastor, he reads for me. And I don't have to do this because I, I get kind of tongue-tied sometimes. But the, verse 8, chapter 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God lives in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Mm. Now, if Christ is in you, this is verse 10. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, verse 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus, the spirit raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. So there you go. You see, you're, not, you're, you're under a new ownership now. The sign around your neck should read, under new management. And secured by the blood of Christ. Amen. The Spirit's presence in the Christian's life is the mark of Christ's ownership. Remember verse 8. You, however, are not in the flesh. I'm sorry. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The pledge and promise of the Holy Spirit at the very end of that verse 11 is that he will raise us up just as he did Christ if you're in the Spirit. Now let's examine verse 14 of our lesson. For those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. All those led by God's Spirit are, the, are God's sons. This is called the Spirit of Adoption. I know it's one of those church terms that you, you hear every once in a while. Uh, but uh, it's another privilege of belonging to those that are in Christ Jesus. Matthew Henry states that all who are Christ are taken into the relationship of children of, of God. Did you know that when God's Spirit enters a believer... It creates a family relationship with God and with other believers. I'm going to read that to you again. Did you know that when God's Spirit enters you or a believer, it creates a family relationship with God and with other believers? You know, I don't believe people who say, yeah, I'm saved, or yeah, I've accepted Christ and never gone to the... the uh, doors of a church. I, I don't believe people when they tell me that. Oh, Frank, you're being judgmental. You're being harsh. Well, you know, this type of behavior from a born-again Christian is inconsistent with the whole teaching of the Bible. Now, you can write a comment. You can, you can say whatever you want. I'll answer you. But that's the truth. Yeah, I was going to list the uh, scripture that talked about gathering together and uh, I could have put down five or six of them. But secured, saved people want to meet with other believers and share what God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are doing in their lives. Just like those little things that I got to share with you this morning. That little bloom on that tomato plant. That little job I got to do for my wife put in that new ice maker. Those are 
are some of the best blessings you'll ever get. And if you don't think those things come from God, you're wrong. Because those little things do come from God. So, like a family gathering, my church family is actually, I'm closer to my church family than I am my actual real family, than my siblings. Um, you know, over the years, uh, I've encouraged people to, to uh, attend church with me because I want them to be saved. I want them to have the same rewards of heaven, the same rewards of, of peace, the same rewards of, of happiness that I have. Uh, and that's what families do. They want to spread the security that we have in Christ. And I want to, I want to encourage you to keep in asking people to come to church with you. You know, even if you can't come to a physical church, you can ask them to come to a, a virtual church, a Facebook church for a time being. But when this is over, come to church. Dawn the doors of the church because that's what saved people do. You know, I wanted to tell you a story about a couple people, a couple men that uh, I've witnessed to throughout the years. And it didn't turn out well for them. But the Holy Spirit just wouldn't let me, wouldn't let me share that with you in, in detail anyways. Maybe one of these days you'll learn about that. But. So getting back to our lesson in verse 15 and 16, I want to read those to you real quick. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. Amen. Now, you know, back in Paul's day in the family unit, it consisted of uh, uh, both of children and slaves. And, but the role of the slave was much different than the role of the child. Born-again believers have entered God's family as sons, not slaves to fall back into fear. See, see we're no longer in condemnation of sin because we're in Christ Jesus. We don't have to fear that. But we are ushered into God's family by the spirit of adoption. The spirit of adoption works in, in the children of God as a... Now this is a, this is a uh, Greek word here. Freely out. Freely out love to God as a father. This freely out love is described as you find delight in him. And you have a dependence on him as a father. In other words, you, you now have a love towards God as a love of a child has for a parent. And you know that is so true in my life. How, how God became a parent to me. How he became my heavenly father. And in turn, God has a love for his work, which is you. He, he truly loves you. And I want to leave you with this. You know, children need a lot of love. They need hugged every day, and they need to, they need patted on the back, and they need, to, they need to be told that they're loved. Well, God has this love for you. Amen. And if, and if you don't believe him, I want you to do this this week. I want you to ask God. close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, I just thank you for uh, a loving church family, a loving wife, a loving family here on earth, but most of all, your love that I feel from heaven mm. every day, every minute of the day. Lord, uh, thank you for making us feel that we're part of your family. Lord, I pray for the health care workers throughout our nation. I yes, pray God. for those that are laying uh, sick in bed. Yes, God. And Lord, I pray that you read this virus from our world, Father. Yes, Lord. Lord. that we might get back to church soon. Lord, uh, how we miss being with Christian friends. Lord, uh, thank you for this opportunity to, to uh, speak about you, speak about your Son, speak about your Holy Spirit, and, 
and what a difference uh, they've made in my life. And Father, I know that you'll make a difference in these people who are listening if, if they'll open their hearts to you. Lord, be with my pastor this next hour as uh, he brings forth your word. And we just thank you. Lord, let us all be found on your will this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, next week, Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 15. See you then.